Welcome everyone to the virtual BSR. As most of you will know by now, my name is Harriet O'Neill and I'm Assistant Director for the Humanities and Social Sciences. For those of you who are new to us, we hold seminars and lectures every Wednesday in Rome and the virtual BSR is our means of continuing that important work. We're going to be holding events every Wednesday until mid-July, so do sign up to our mailing list or via Twitter where you can register for our talks. Peter is going to um, do, this, do the introduction to Florian, Mr. New Florian. but um, before that I just wanted to say that the, the event is being recorded and we invite your contributions, so please do send in any questions you have via the Q&A function which is at the bottom of your screens. So thank you very much and over to Peter, thank you. Thank you, Harriet. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce Florian Musnung, who is at University College London and researches literature and critical theory. And uh, Florian has been a frequent visitor to the BSR. Uh, we've been very for fortunate to have him in the building, um, discussing a wide range of things, attending events. Uh, we even had philosophy roundtables where we were discussing uh, literature and, and readings. And uh, he's been a visiting research fellow here at the British School at Rome. And uh, he's in Rome uh, frequently, uh, if not permanently, because he is the academic director of the UCL Cities Partnership Program based here in Rome. So he teaches Italian and comparative literature, uh, as I said, at University College London. And uh, he founded the comparative literature program there. He's published widely on 20th and 21st century uh, literature. Um, and uh, he examines theory and, as we were here, philosophy. And he is a co-investigator on an HRC project, Interdisciplinary Italy, 1900 to 2020, Interart Intermedia. And this explores different strands of radical literature, visual, and performing performative arts, uh, specifically uh, from the 1960s and 70s, which is what Florian is looking at. And as you can hear, uh, he is a polymath with uh, interests and, and research in a wide variety of backgrounds. Uh, and his talk tonight is titled Oceanic Features, Dystopia After Lockdown, and it is sure to be an exciting and interesting lecture. So Florian, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you for, for speaking with us tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Harriet and Peter, and uh, thank you to the BSR and obviously also to the director of the British School at Rome, to, to Steve Milner for, for I guess having me uh, in in a way, uh, we're still adjusting our metaphors and our um, habits of speech to this new situation. And I certainly can't say that I'm not nervous about uh, speaking to myself in a room <laughs> and um, being recorded, but I am aware that uh, several people may be in a virtual audience and I'm very grateful to to all of you, uh, so it's a pleasure. Uh, I will now do my best to switch on my PowerPoint, which I hope you will see. Let me see if this works. And so you should now hopefully be able to see an image of waves. Uh, if that is not correct, please, um, Harriet and Peter, do join the call again and tell me that something is wrong. Uh, right, I should also say that just in terms of sort of um, how I will manage this, I have prepared a text because it's difficult for me otherwise to have a sense of sort of uh, my audience. So I won't, I won't improvise. Uh, I will read and I, I will reiterate certain points in case you sort of come and go, uh, your connection disappears or you uh, have to sort of rush off and um, fix dinner for your children or do some grocery shopping or whatever, all things that, that are part of our new normal. Right, so, um, oceanic futures, dystopia after lockdown. Let your eyes wander and admire the majestic view of the ocean. Imagine a realm of pure nature, a vast blank space outside human control. Aqua nullius. The sea is limitless, 
and unbound. Its primordial fertility lies outside the orbit of history. Take a deep breath and consider how the ocean spans our world. You should feel elated. This is the sensation that Romain Roland on Sigmund Freud called the oceanic feeling and which inspired Gaston Bachelard to wax lyrically about, I quote, the substantive nothingness of water, end of quote. Here are Odysseus, Sinbad the sailor and Moby Dick. Here are our favorite dreams of the South Sea narrated by Emilio Salgari, who never left Italy, Jules Verne, who never left Europe, and Karl May, who wrote about tropical beaches, but saw them only years later and was deeply disappointed. Here are the tritons, sirens, and pirates of our childhood. Here are Nemo, Ariel, and Jack Sparrow. Here is the candid reverence that Primo Levi describes in his story of Avrom, La Storia di Avrom, the tale of an 18-year-old Jewish partisan who saw the Mediterranean for the first time on the first day of peace and for whom the ocean always spoke of a world without borders or violence. Are you feeling elated? It is no longer easy to dream of the sea. The ocean is regulated by political, economic and military interests. The noxious legacy of centuries of maritime imperialism and violence is habitually revealed by the outbreak of new territorial conflicts. Europe's brutal border regime in the Mediterranean has provoked the suffering and death of innumerable migrants and refugees. Under the ocean surface, the collapse of ecosystems is equally painful to contemplate. Countless species have been overfished to the point of extinction or have been endangered by the thoughtless destruction of marine habitats. Atomic testing and deep sea mining have caused irreparable damage. Industrialization and the runoff from sewage and chemical fertilizers have accelerated the spread of anoxic waters or so-called dead zones. Ocean acidification, deep sea warming and plastic pollution are destroying complex ecosystems which have been home to thousands of species. Veteran environmentalist Bill McKibben warns that by the middle of this century, oceans are likely to contain more plastic than fish by weight. All the world's coral reefs might be dead by then. The future of the sea is bleak and has perhaps no better symbol than the great Pacific garbage patch, an enormous concentration of floating plastic which is currently approaching the size of Russia. What will happen to us, asks literary critic Steve Mentz, when all waters everywhere throb with these same colors, these same plastics, this toxicity. Meanwhile, human societies are becoming more oceanic. The water is rising on us. Carbon dioxide emission has tipped the planet's biological and geochemical systems towards progressive devastation and is triggering a series of overlapping environmental crises. Global warming marks an existential threat to numerous species and may put human survival at risk. Beyond the specific expertise of Earth and climate scientists, environmental justice has become a concern for many activists, artists and cultural commentators and for a growing number of researchers in the arts and humanities. In this context, sea level rise has attracted particular attention as perhaps the most visible sign of the climate crisis. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, 
estimates that sea levels will rise by approximately half a meter in the 21st century if drastic cuts to carbon emissions are imposed now. Without such cuts, oceans are expected to rise twice as much by 1,100, 2,100, excuse me. Large floods are also predicted to occur with increasing frequency, especially in tropical regions. Indeed, these vulnerable areas, what uh, Christian Parenti calls the Tropic of Chaos, will be ravaged by multiple natural disasters at once due to complex weather systems and feedback loops. Warmer oceans, for example, do not only accelerate the melt of ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica, they also absorb less heat from the atmosphere and thereby increase the likelihood of heat waves and droughts. Similarly, sea level rise and frequent flooding will inundate farmland, cause crop failure, and thus push climate refugees into other regions. Such cascades will have a particularly devastating impact on coastal communities. And it has been suggested that rising sea levels may leave hundreds of millions of people without a home by 2050. And this is just the beginning. Science journalist Peter Brannan neatly sums up the long-term consequences of unchecked global warming. And I quote, within a couple of centuries, much of Florida will drown. So too will Bangladesh, most of the Nile Delta and New Orleans. In the centuries beyond, if our experiment with the climate goes unchecked, so too will much of New York City, Boston, Amsterdam, Venice, and countless other temporary shelters of humanity." End of quote. Literature and the creative arts have entered the self-conscious Anthropocene, to quote Lynn Keller's illuminating terminology. And I just maybe explain here that the self-conscious Anthropocene is an attempt to get around the debate the very sort of important debate as to the beginning of uh, the dating of this particular geological period um, by focusing from an arts and humanities and social science perspective, not on the starting point of the Anthropocene, but the starting point of the use of the term Anthropocene, so uh, 2000. So the self-conscious Anthropocene, in other words, is the period of the past two decades. Faced with the gravity of the unfolding environmental crisis, historians, philosophers, and literary critics have turned their attention to Paul Crutzen's and Eugene Sturmer's famous neologism, first coined, as I just said, in 2000. For many researchers, the term Anthropocene remains a conceptual stumbling stone, a scandalous presence. Earlier today, I was virtually um, taking part in the opening uh, meeting of the UCL Anthropocene Institute. And interestingly, much of the discussion was again on whether this is a term which um, with an implicit um, universalistic assumption that jars with um, um, a sort of interest in um, climate justice in uh, uh, inequalities of power um, across uh, regions, across uh, gender and, and ethnicity. So this is the big uh, context in which we are talking about a conceptual stumbling stone. As Yussi Parika points out, the implicit universalism of Anthropocene thinking marks a conspicuous challenge to the arts, but has also served as, I quote, a useful trigger for a variety of approaches that are interested in the non-human and post-human, end of quote. In this sense, the self-conscious Anthropocene, similarly to, say, postmodernism, has functioned as an important transdisciplinary vector for the emergent cross-disciplinary framework that links cultural theory, the creative humanities, political philosophy, ethics, and the social sciences. Many earth scientists and bioscientists have also become attentive to political, economic, 
social and cultural structures in a manner that cuts across established disciplinary boundaries and calls for a reconceptualization of the relation between humans and non-human nature. As novelist Amitav Ghosh famously pointed out, and you've got the quotation here in the PowerPoint, the climate crisis is also a crisis of culture and thus of the imagination. So how have our stories changed and developed in response to the climate emergency? Fluidity, mutability, and fear are the hallmarks of an emergent new oceanic imaginary, as Elizabeth de la Frey explains. In many recent novels and films, the sea features as a dynamic, intimate, and threatening force, not an alien ocean in Stefan Helmreich's words, but an encroaching, uncanny presence that disrupts the flow of everyday life. And I'll just give you some examples now, some literary examples of this new oceanic imaginary. Claire Morrill's novel, When the Floods Came, is set in a largely abandoned tower block outside Birmingham in an area that is frequently flooded and has become inaccessible for months at a time. 22-year-old protagonist Rosa Polanski and her family of six lead a seemingly normal life, working online for a Chinese company, feeding on the care packages delivered by North American drone drops, as she calls them, and riding their bicycles around empty roads when water levels are sufficiently low. And if you're thinking what I'm thinking, then yes, of course, many of these dystopian fictions are now uncannily resonant with our experience of life under lockdown. So um, working online, feeding on care packages, not quite, but also this hope, this sort of longing to go outside and these sort of rare and precious moments of cycling around empty roads. And in fact, the, the case has been made by by scholars of science fiction that we are living at the moment in, in a kind of sort of real life dystopia. And I'll, I'll say something about this in the second half of my talk later on. So um, going back to very briefly to Claire Morrill's novel, um, and just to give you a sense of the content of this, of this novel, um, I also wanted to tell you what happens during flood season. So the Polanskis play indoor games, watch old films, argue over Rosa's wish for a digitally arranged marriage. She wants to marry somebody in Bristol who of course she could not have met in person. She could only sort of uh, commute by helicopter and it's very, very difficult in that world to travel um, by helicopter. Um, the Polanskis also discuss the sporadic news that reached them through a heavily censored internet. But when their conversations touch the recent global pandemic in the novel that has decimated the human world population, Wistful Rosa concedes that, I quote, our family has been lucky. Her more reckless sister Delphine, however, declares that comparisons with the past are pointless something for old people like their parents. And I quote, they need to think about the now, says Delphine. Why can't they just get on with things and forget the world they grew up in? It's never going to come back. Another example. Helen Marshall's The Migration is another good example of cli-fi. Cli-fi is the term which uh, journalist Angela Evansi has coined for an increasingly popular literary genre that, as it were, rides the crest of our growing wave of climate anxiety. So, cli fi climate fiction. Right? So, um, where uh, Claire Morrill drew inspiration from the Birmingham Art Gallery, Helen Marshall imagines a near future Oxford which slowly but steadily vanishes under the river Charles rising waters. 
like in Morrill's novel, the family at the heart of the migration appears unaware, blissfully ignorant, or stoically indifferent to the unfolding climate emergency, at least until a mysterious new immune disorder begins to afflict the young. And if you're thinking again, sorry, what I'm thinking, then yes, these books are rather formulaic. And the combination of flood and pandemic is something which we find in very, very, very many recent uh, works of sci-fi. So just to give you a sense of how characters in this fiction, how, how adult characters in these fictions are not seemingly aware of the threat, um, I will mention Aunt Irene, a medieval historian, fictional character in the novel, who works on the um, Black Death and says she's always intrigued by medieval records because she proclaims a disaster that large would be unimaginable in the 21st century. And she says, this is a quote, there wasn't anything in my experience that would help me understand it. The irony here, of course, lies in the fact that Irene's college is already literally surrounded by an even greater menace, the flood and the pandemic. A menace, a threat that remains unaccounted for in this passage, but which will shortly cause the apparent death of two of the main characters. Again, it is the novel's younger protagonist, Sophie, who arrives at a radically different understanding of existential risk. In an inundated world, she contends, it is easier to imagine the horrors of the Black Death than to recall the surprising stability and predictability, she calls it the unimaginable uh, stability of Holocenic ecologies and societies. In other words, her parents lived experience just a generation earlier. Don't you feel it? Sophie asks her friend Brian as they both stare at the flooded expanse of Port Meadow. This can't be forever. Maybe the work, sorry, maybe the world worked one way for our parents and for their parents, but not for us. It isn't the same. So there are numerous other literary examples that we could discuss. Port Meadow and the Thames Valley, for example, are also flooded in Philip Pullman's La Belle Sauvage, um, 2017, uh, the opening volume of his second trilogy, uh, the Trilogy of Dust, I think it's called. Um, Nathaniel Rich's Odds Against Tomorrow imagines Manhattan underwater, but also if we want to um, for a moment, uh, think of some non-Anglophone examples. We have um, in Italy, Antonio Scurati, who conjures a mid-century, mid-21st century underwater Venice under a large glass cupola for the benefit of wealthy Chinese tourists. That's in the novel, La Seconda Mezzanotte. Delving similarly into a fictional but darkly resonant dystopian future, Ben Smith's skillfully dreary novel, Doggerland, is set on a vast coastal wind farm where two Beckettian characters, a boy and an old man, who call each other boy and old man, just to sort of, kind of drive home the Beckettian point, I guess, uh, where they lead a life of monotony and confinement surrounded by floating debris and a dying ocean. While the taciturn old man appears to hold some knowledge of the environmental catastrophe that hit the mainland, the boy's life has been confined to the bleak archipelago of offshore platforms, which function in this novel as a precarious space of last retreat or in Elizabeth Delafray's words, as a, what she calls a minimal aquatopia. And again, um, offshore platforms are, are everywhere in this, in this genre. Um, John Lancaster's uh, The Wall, um, which was 
a very interesting, I thought, addition to the, to the genre in, in 2019, actually begins on, in a kind of sort of uh, near future Britain, which is surrounded precisely by a wall, which has to be guarded against, uh, so the wall exists to protect Britain against rising sea levels, but also the wall has to be guarded against climate refugees all the time, and um, ends again on an offshore platform. Um, or um, even more recently in 2020, there is a novel uh, less, uh, um, in my view, interesting, uh, important novel, but, but quite good fun um, by Andrew Hunter Murray called The Last Day, and um, which begins on an offshore platform. So. Climate dystopia, right? Doggerland, when the floods came, and the migration belong to a highly recognizable popular genre, which political scientist Lucy Sargison has described as climate dystopia. We may also think of these narratives as critical dystopias, according to Tom Moylan's influential definition. And for those of you who are not uh, in, uh, familiar with, with Moylan's work, um, a critical dystopia is essentially. Uh, according to, to his argument, a dystopia which seeks to articulate a very progressive, in terms of, of the author's own political views, a very progressive and positive message, but in, within the, the context of a, of a dystopian narrative and dystopian fictional setting. Um, so they could be read as critical dystopias, um, and I'll explain uh, now why I, why I think that Tom Moylan's uh, definition is relevant. Um, fictional events are set in the near future but resonate with the social demands and environmentalist concerns of our own age and invite an urgent political response. So the shocking mirror of cognitive estrangement, to use Darko Suvin's well-known um, definition of science fiction, um, cognitive estrangement in these works is very literally and directly held up to the reader in an attempt to expose the flaws and contradictions of 21st century climate politics. More specifically, we could say that each of the novels features contrasting responses, and by which, um, by this I mean to say, so political um, positions, but also um, different levels of affect, different um, existential uh, and emotional responses to the climate emergency. By juxtaposing these differences, they raise questions about responsibility and agency. In each of the three novels, we find a contrast between laconic endurance and the subversive desire for uh, reconstruction of society, reconstruction of society is Lucy Sargson's definition of utopianism. In each of the three novels, this tension between endurance and utopianism is played out in generational terms, according to a set of tropes that is now also familiar to us through uh, climate activism. Right? The, the idea of the, the climate activism as a clash between generations. According to a very prominent narrative, only the young can comprehend the obsolescence or can accept the obsolescence of 21st century civilization and the inadequacy of conventional tragic responses to global warming. I'll just refer for a moment to Timothy Morton. Um, I'm glad that uh, Peter Campbell is, is chairing this session today because Peter has done some very interesting work in his own field uh, using some of Timothy Morton's ideas and um, talked about this last week in, in this lecture series. So um, I hope that uh, the reference to Timothy Morton will also provide an opportunity for us to, as it were, sort of create a, a connection at that level. So um, Timothy Morton uh, 
describes in this book describes tragedy as in, in a slightly sort of um, faux fanny um, uh, register as uh, the default agricultural mode. So as long as we kind of sort of mourn climate change, we can't relate to climate change because the tragic register, according to Morton, is, is inadequate. Um, um, the, in the novels that I just summarized, uh, the parents in each and every case, or the old man in, in uh, Ben Smith's novel, uh, who's not the father, uh, not father to the boy, um, but the old generation, are uh, identified with the tragic default agricultural mode, right, in Morton's terms. Um, the young generation, in each and every case, is the generation born into what Morton calls the weird weirdness of environmental catastrophe. And only they are capable of agency. Uh, in, so just to give you one last example from um, The Wall, from uh, John Lancaster, um, one of the rather more moving scenes, at least for me when I read it, was a scene in which the, the protagonist, who is a young, uh, an adolescent, um, watches, he leaves the family home and as he turns around and looks back into the living room, he sees that his parents are watching a TV program with recorded images of the beach and weep. And they, they're embarrassed to, they, they don't want to sort of watch this, um, they don't want to share this almost sort of pornographic, um, fetishistic pleasure of, of the past uh, with this new generation. So they, I think this is a rather sort of, poignant way of articulating the, the gap between the tragic mode and, the, um, and this sort of new sense of, uh, of agency. So um, dark ecologies, uh, Timothy Morton's book also uh, introduces the idea of the environmental uncanny. And it's interesting uh, in light of this to observe that um, in each of the fictions that I've mentioned, the tension between finitude and post-catastrophic vitality is played out in surprisingly ordinary settings. So, um, as I said, family homes, um, or the, um, the wind farms, the offshore wind farms in, in, in Ben Smith, which are sort of described as, as very dreary, boring, monotonous um, places. Uh, rising sea levels, and flooded wastelands are not in the fictions harbingers of a future menace, but part of the quotidian, the everyday, in a manner that collapses the difference between personal and planetary scale. So let me now, in the, in the second and final part of the, the talk, move on to, to this idea, so more specifically to this idea of sort of space and lockdown. It is worth pointing out that each of the three novels is set in an increasingly small and oppressively claustrophobic fictional world. When the floods came, Doggerland and the migration can be said to embrace one of the most characteristic generic conventions of utopian and dystopian fiction, spatialization. Ever since Thomas Moore conceived of his island kingdom, journeys, Walls, islands, barriers have been a defining feature of the genre. And Frederick Jameson, among others, has, has written about this. Uh, Utopian worlds are imagined as physically remote or distant in time, even where their political critique of the contemporary is concrete and specific. As Peter Rupert remarks, traditional utopias are always self-contained and static. Nothing of significance ever happens, or more precisely, everything of significance has already taken place. So they're good places, they're good societies, because they no longer require polit political experiment, they no longer require time. And this particular aspect of conventional utopian writing, 
has been associated by uh, Chris Ferns, for example, um, with um, apocalyptic religion. So the, the vision, the monumental vision of a sort of, of a place after the end of time, the heavenly Jerusalem, if you wish. Um, Stephen Goldsmith in the book, which um, I um, mentioned here on the, on the handout, uh, talks about apocalypse as, I quote, the sublime rupture that occurs when time becomes space, when history meets its final antithesis in a heavenly city and in a book. So um, this is something which is very prominent in traditional utopian and also arguably dystopian fiction, um, the shift from temporal to spatial order. Despite their attention to place, and this is my, my key argument, this is really the point I, I would like to make today, oceanic dystopias break with this tradition, with this traditional spatialization. Their engagement with fluidity, sorry, we're not quite there. Um, so um, the uh, oceanic dystopias break with the tradition of spatialization. Their engagement with fluidity marks the emergence of a new affective register which runs counter to the spatializing impulse of 20th century speculative fiction. In order to understand the political relevance of this new register, let me briefly reflect on the significance of space and place in environmental discourse. So, and also, in fact, that this, this is the point where I would like to sort of very briefly comment on the experience of spatial restrictions under lockdown as well, which is something that, of course, um, is now really prompting new approaches or new perspectives in, in almost every uh, debate. So um, the, um, it certainly seems to be the case that the COVID emergency has made us aware of spatial restrictions in a way that must have seemed obsolete to 20th and especially 21st century global elites. Our current experience of lockdown, however, as environmental activists have pointed out, for example, George Monibot in The, in the Guardian, um, the current experience of lockdown might be a halving of things to come. And again, I refer to Bill McKibben, who I quoted earlier, um, and to his most recent monograph, which is called Falter, Has the Human Game Begun to Play Itself Out? And McKibben begins this book with a celebration of the diversity of human achievements, and he lists them at great length, um, culture, commerce, politics, religion, sports, dance, music, dinner, art, uh, Instagram, love, uh, sex, uh, etc. Um, go through this list mentally and check how many of these are still available to you under lockdown. Instagram, definitely, I guess. But um, McKibben's point is rather that this extraordinary tangle of practices, rules and emotions is in its entirety threatened by the climate crisis. <clears throat> and he writes, and I quote this, we are putting the human game at risk because human activity has already, I quote, changed the board on which the game is played and in more profound ways than almost anyone now imagines. And finally, he says, the habitable planet has literally begun to shrink. So this book was obviously published prior to the, the COVID emergency. So it suggests that this idea of a shrinking world already resonated powerfully in environmental debates and in popular science writing and in dystopian science fiction prior to the current health crisis. Another example could be the North American journalist David Wallace Wells, in his book, um, The Uninhabitable Earth, 
um, where he says that um, only a fraction of the surface of the planet will be available to us in the future. <coughs> so, McKibben will, um, and Wallace Wells oppose the cultural and economic policies of capitalist globalization. Their shared vision of a shrinking world owes nothing to the utopian globalist fantasy of a borderless world brought together by vast transnational egalitarian networks of economic, technological, and cultural interdependence. So the shrinking world is not the shrinking world, say, of, um, I don't know, Anthony Giddens, for example, or Emmanuel Castells. Um, it's not a sort of um, globalized um, utopia or even a sort of global dystopia, but it's a world after the collapse of global connectivity. It's a, what I call here a tragically plausible worst case scenario. Now I'd like to argue, I'd like to suggest that oceanic dystopias resonate with these concerns. They, they, they resonate with shrinking world discourse. But in addition to this, they also promote and enable a different kind of subversive critique of globalization. And this other level of subversive critique, if you bear with me, is very much linked to the idea of fluidity. And it's, I would argue, qualitatively different from both the globalized or the globalists' idea of sort of flows of good and information and from this uh, shrinking world discourse that we find in McKibben or in, in Wallace Wells. So, um, my, without going into detail here, because I've spoken for possibly already too long, um, in the longer version of this, of this text, um, I seek to explain how um, oceanic thinking actually draws from world literature, from debates in world literature, and how sort of world literature through the works of researchers, of, of theorists such as Emily Apter, Feng Chia, or Amir Mufti, comparatists has actually, world literature has actually sort of become a very, very important observe, critical observatory of cultural globalization. So, um, in a sense, the, the bigger project for me is to position Anthropocene discourse or the sort of self-conscious Anthropocene in relation to debates in world literature through the, the, the shared reliance on post-colonial theory. But more specifically, for the purpose of this talk today, I would just like to sort of give you a very brief, um, in the final you know, few minutes um, of, the, of the lecture, a very brief definition of oceanic thinking. Um, oceanic thinking, which, which relies on the, um, the, the idea of oceanic thinking, which relies on, on, the, on the work of Elizabeth de la Frey, which I already mentioned earlier, um, but also um, embraces and develops the positions of um, Gayatri Spivak in um, Death of a Discipline, so her idea of the planetary, and also of environmental thinkers such as Lorraine Code, Ursula Heise and William Connolly. Um, so what marks oceanic thinking um, as a theory of knowledge is the rejection of the abstract, interchangeable, autonomous individual of liberal moral political theory, the invitation to stretch the limits of our imagination towards new forms of responsibility and local 
sensitivity, the importance of more than human worlds as shared habitats, the idea of nature as an agent, a co-constitutive presence that intersects with human culture and society in a single, for volatile, in a single kind of sort of constantly evolving force field. So um, oceanic thinking, according to this definition, is very similar and, and, and in fact um, is based, is premised on the work that, for example, Amy Elias and Christian Muraru have done in their work on planetary, on the planetary term. Um, you, you have the reference here in the, in the PowerPoint. So um, Elias and Muraru, I'm just going to read you this one um, quotation. Um, uh, Elias and Muraru say that um, planetary life, I quote, consists in an incessantly thickening, historically unprecedented web of relations among people, cultures, and locales. To comprehend the planetary, we must grasp the relationality embedded in it. And just to add to this, I would like to sort of stress, and I think this is important for our understanding of oceanic dystopian fiction in particular, I'd like to stress that relationality is not only spatial, but also temporal. So fluidity is also, by analogy, not only spatial, but temporal. And this point is rather, I think, elegantly made by human geographer Andreas Malm in this book here, The Progress of This Storm, where he says that cultural theory must account for the, what he calls the peculiar temporal directionalities of climate change. In other words, the fact that global warming is felt today, but is the result of actions in the past, and that our own actions are only going to become apparent, or rather the, the consequences of our own actions is only going to become apparent over time. Um, so what, what, Malm, what Andreas Malm says is that um, our growing political awareness of climate change in the present is necessarily always directed towards the future. To, to the point when the catastrophic impact of our own actions will be felt. And this temporal discordance, according to Malm, and I would, would agree with Malm on, on, this, on this important point, this temporal discordance means that political activism for Malm, but also climate fiction, in my understanding, must be based on diachronic conceptual maps. So they mu it must reach out into the future. Um, and the, here's the, the quotation from, from Malm where he makes this point. I'll just read this out. Um, this is the last long quotation. We're almost at the end of the lecture. Please bear with me. Thank you very much. So Malm says, there is no synchronicity in climate change. Now, more than ever, we inhabit the diachronic, the discordant, the inchoate. History has sprung alive through a nature that has done likewise. We are only in the very early stages, but already our daily life, our psychic experience, our cultural responses, even our politics, show signs of being sucked back by planetary forces into the whole of time, the present dissolving into past and future alike. So what Malm describes here, and this is why I think world literature is very important actually, why the debates in, in comparative literary studies are sort of key to this, to this wider issue. What Malm describes here is precisely the sense of planetary and historical deep time that also interests comparatists such as Y.G. Demock. Uh, Y.G. Demock talks about um, 
uh, novels which establish a set of what she calls longitudinal frames, um, binding continents and millennia into many loops of relations, a densely interactive fabric, end of quote. So this systematic attention to past, remote past, near future and distant future is characteristic of comparative thinking and also more specifically characteristic of climate dystopia. And it holds the power, I would, I would like to suggest here, to subvert conventional ideas of spatial fixity. So, oops. In conclusion then, um, Emily Apter, in the final chapter of her book Against World Literature, suggests that, I quote, the premonition of earthly extinction has contributed to a shift in the status of the word world in world literature. And then she says that recent philosophers and writers have given voice to what she calls a mood of planetary dysphoria. That's Apter's own coinage. So a, a mood of superficial restlessness, irritability, but also a mood of kind of sort of underlying paralysis, profound sadness, the perceived impossibility of a positive future. Emily's, Emily Apter says, um, planetary dysphoria, I quote, captures the geo-psychoanalytic state of the world as its most depressed and unruic, awaiting the triumphant revenge of acid, oil, and dust, end of quote. Now, just to sort of reiterate my point for the, for the final time, I... In my analysis, I agree with the topicality of Apter's reflections, but I would strongly suggest that climate fiction and climate dystopia holds the power to transcend dysphoric perspectives. Um, precisely because I think that this, this idea of sort of planetary dysphoria or planetary mourning is a static category. It's rather similar to the spatial paradigms of 20th century dystopia. And I think one of the, the opportunities afforded to us by, by, by this new idea of sort of oceanic thinking is um, the opportunity to rethink categories of place and space through the unpredictability of post Holocenic societies and ecologies. And in my most optimistic moments, I would even say that perhaps this allows us to sort of recuperate some of the vital energy that Romain Roland and Sigmund Freud ascribed to oceanic feeling, not in the sense of oceanic feeling, but in the sense of oceanic thinking. So um, oceanic thinking as an awareness of the cascading existential risk and planetary entanglement that surrounds us, but as um, an insistence that we are not working towards a new normal, but that all our interactions are always generative in the context of a protracted uncertainty that still necessitates new forms of agency and new projections of the future.